Okay, so the second law, the first law of reflection is angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. Second law, all the three lie in the same plane. The incident ray, the reflected ray, and the normal, they all lie in the same plane. As you can see, it's the plane of the screen here, right? So th those are the two laws of reflection. All the three lie in the same plane. Easy to understand. This is a case of diffuse reflection. And uh, you can see that the surface there is not a plain surface. It's a rough surface. If you look at the surface of a table through a microscope, that's how it's going to look like. When you feel it, it looks like it's plain and smooth, but through a microscope, it's going to look like that. That is why the light rays from the table are reflected in a diffuse manner, and you're not able to see your image when you look into it, just like you can see in a plain mirror. Does that make sense? Okay. So that is diffuse reflection. Uh, here you see regular reflection, image formed by a, a plain mirror. In this case, the Wherever you have your eye, you catch some rays. Well, this is diffuse reflection again. Uh, I'm talking about this part. If you have your eye here, you see there's actually a whole beam of light rays that get into your eye. A collection of rays is called a beam, of course, a collection of rays. So that's why you can really see something and see the image. But then again, as it's written there, your eye must be in the correct position for you to be able to see it. If, uh, like, there's a big plane mirror and a, one person is standing on the other side, for you to see the image of that person, you've got to place yourself in such a way that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. You know what I'm talking about. So if you put your eye in a perfect position, you'll be able to see his image. So you must place your eye in a position so as to get the reflected rays. Uh, this, although this figure looks like a very simple one, it gives you four properties of any image. Uh, we're going to talk about so many kinds of images. But there are four properties. The first property, because it's not written down here, I will try to write. The first property is called the nature of the image. The nature of the image. And you have two options. An image could either be real or it could be what's called virtual. A virtual means a fake image. Actually, there's no image, but we feel that there is an image. So nature can be twofold. And then you have size of the image. In this case, you can have three options. Uh, size of the image could be the same as the size of the object, so it could be same size. It could be bigger than we say it's magnified, or it could be smaller when we say than we say it's diminished. So three options there. Magnified, diminished, same size. Then the third one is the position of the image. However, oh, that has so many options. It could be anywhere. If you look at this figure, uh, you know where the position of the image is. Is as much behind the mirror as the object is in front of it. Did you hear me? So if I call this, well, it's already called, and you just keep listening. The distance of the object from the reflecting surface is always DO, distance of object, DO. Distance of the image from the Reflecting surface is di. And in this figure, what is the relation between do and di? I want a mathematical equation. If you say, oh, that's, the, that's what I expected from... Thank you. Do is equal to negative di. Because if you say DO is equal to di, that means the image must be exactly in the position where the object is, which is not the case here. It's behind. So keep that in your mind. And whenever you write that, whenever you put DO is equal to negative DI, 
this negative is going to show you that it's a virtual image. A, a virtual image is a negative distance. Got that? That means it's behind. Okay. And uh, the last one, so that's about the position. The last one is the type of image. Try to get your sleep at home. This is going on YouTube. Try to get your sleep at home so that you don't sleep in a physics class. Uh, that's on YouTube. Anyway, the type of <laughs> image, it could either be, look at this. The object and the image. Look at it. It's not inverted, is it? It's upright. The cap of the bottle is on top, and the same is the case with the image. But in some cases, you would have an inverted image. So you could have two types of images. One is upright. I don't have space to write anyway. Upright and inverted. So those are the four properties of the image. Number one, uh, the nature of the image could be real or virtual. Number two, the size could be same size, magnified, diminished. Position of the image, several options there. Chiefly could be in front or behind. And type of the image could be either upright or inward. See, a real image is something that you can catch on a screen, like a projector. This image that you see here is produced by a convex lens. Believe me, there's a convex lens inside. And so this is a real image because you can produce it on a screen. But the image that you see in a plain mirror or that you think you see of yourself cannot ever be trapped on a screen. You cannot get that on a screen. That's a virtual image. You think you see something and what you see is correct. Well, you cannot get it on a screen. So that's the primary difference between a real image and a virtual image. You can get a real image on a screen. You cannot ever get a virtual image on a screen. So I give you the second difference now. So first one, I told you mathematically, if you're negative, it's virtual. Positive is real. Okay. But there's a third difference for which I'll have to show you a diagram. Otherwise, you wouldn't understand. Uh, this is a typical example from a textbook and says uh, how big must be a mirror to get your full size image. I put it there because it's interesting. How big should the mirror be to get your full size image? People sometimes think it should be as big as you are. No. If you look at this figure, you understand that for this person to see her complete image, the incident ray from the feet, from the toes, must reach her eye. Surely then she'll be seeing this part. And also the ray from the top of her head must reach her eye. Are you with me? If that happens, then she'll be able to see everything from the top of her head to her toes. And you can see that the mirror, in that case, must not be on the floor. It must be lifted off the floor. You see that green line? That's the mirror. It's kept in such a way that this ray just falls on it, if you watch carefully, you can see that. And again, the ray from the top of the head just falls on the top of the mirror. So that's the minimum size of the mirror required, which can be calculated from these distances. 1.5 meter is the distance from here to her eye. That's not a height. And that is how much uh, below the top of her head, her eye is. Try and you will understand. So looking at that figure, can you tell me what's the minimum size of that mirror? Simple math. What is the minimum size of that mirror? I'm, I'm listening. I mean, these two are given. And you know that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection, so you, there is perfect symmetry here. Come on now, I don't want to give the answer. I don't want to give the answer. This distance is 0.75. I, I hope you understood that much. It, the mirror must be kept 0.75 meter from the floor, right? You got it? Okay. And how much is this? 
it should be 0.75 plus 0.05, and I heard somebody say 80 centimeter, that's the answer. Okay, if you didn't get it, stand in front of a plane mirror until you get it. Now, going from a plane, and I could have used that one to tell you the third difference between a real image and a virtual image. Okay, look at this. The reflected ray, what's this? This is reflected ray number one, isn't it? It appears to be coming from here. Because we can only think that light comes from right behind. We are fooled every time into thinking that even though light bends, you see, it actually comes from here, but our brain can only think that it's coming from right behind. That's a very important point. So we think that the toes are here, and again, we think that the tip of the head, because this reflected ray appears to be coming from here, the tip of the head is there, or top of the head. Now, this is a virtual image. Because you see that the reflected rays, watch again, the two reflected rays, this is reflected ray number one. This is reflected ray number two, isn't it? They do not intersect. Do they? I mean, do they meet each other? Do they actually meet each other? No, they don't. Look at it. It appears to be coming from somewhere. Two things. It's not a real thing. It's an appearance. At least you could have got that. It's not a real ray. It's like we're thinking it's coming from there. That's why this is a virtual image. You cannot touch that image. It's not produced in the mirror. It's produced behind the mirror. That makes sense? It's... You know what I'm trying to say? It's produced by the mirror, not in the mirror. It's produced behind the mirror. It'll be as much behind as you are in front. Therefore, you cannot touch your image. But if you try to touch your image, suddenly you'll be thinking you're touching a fingertip. But again, that fingertip is not really touching the image because there's a thickness of the mirror that separates them. I hope you got the whole idea now. That's as close as you can get. Okay, wonderful. Now, in place of a plane mirror, scientists started thinking about what happens if you, make, if you take a spherical mirror. What's a spherical mirror? If you have a rubber a ball, that's a sphere, and you take a compass, if you know what it is, to draw a circle on top of that, visualize. Draw a circle on top of a sphere and cut it out over the circle that you have drawn. What do you have now? You have a part of a sphere, don't you? Just like my hand here. If the inner side of this sphere is reflecting, it's a concave mirror, like the palm of my hand. That's a concave mirror. But if the outer side is reflecting, it's a convex mirror. So it's concave and convex. Driving mirrors that you use and you cannot live without in a car are what kind of a mirror? It's a convex mirror. So at the end of this lesson, we need to say why we cannot use a concave mirror there. That will be tragedy straight away. Okay, and uh, there are other uses for concave mirrors, but all, before that, just understand, as this figure represents that, the laws of reflection are obeyed even in this case. You see that? You see that if you draw, one great important thing which they should have drawn here, I'm going to draw. What happens if you extend this normal and uh, extend the normal for this one, which they have not drawn? Where will they meet somebody? Can you tell me that, that point where they will meet, where the normals will meet? Will be the center of that sphere. <coughs> and therefore, like what you said, this would be the radius of the sphere. So keep that in mind. The normal always passes through the center of the sphere, of which the mirror is a part. So when you make diagrams, keep that in mind. Rays that come from far away are regarded to be parallel to each other. So if you're ever trying to get the image of the sun, and you know the sun is really far away, you would draw the rays falling to be parallel. That means the incident rays would be parallel. It need not be the sun, could be a tree really far away. Don't ask me how far away. 
you know, could be 100 meters away, and you could assume that the rays coming from those three are parallel. Okay, again, a crucial point. They've, they will actually spend one slide just to show that. Because if you look at this part, you see they almost become parallel there. You see that? And the further the tree is, the more parallel it will become here. Visualize. And what happens to parallel rays falling on a, con a concave mirror? They all come to focus. Or technically, they must. Although in this figure, they do not all come to focus. Did you notice that? We can separate the rays into two types. Rays that fall on the outside, you see? Rays that fall. Remember that if I turn the concave mirror towards you, it will be circular. Isn't it? So the rays that fall near the margin, they do not come to focus at the points where the rays closer to the axis come. You see that difference? Rays that are, clo uh, that are come on, positive or negative. The concave mirror has a real focus. Anything that is real is taken as positive. A convex mirror, although you've not seen it yet, is the opposite. It has a virtual focus. So whenever you have a problem on a convex mirror and the focal length is given as, let's say, 10 centimeter, you wouldn't take it as positive 10. You'll take it as negative 10 if it's a convex mirror because it's a virtual focus. Are you getting it? Now, again, another difference, a concave mirror can produce both real and virtual, but a convex mirror can only produce virtual. I would be happy if you would close the textbooks and listen to me. And uh, take, if a ray comes along the normal, what's the angle of incidence? If a ray is coming along the normal, drawn at that point, what is the angle of incidence? Zero, Zero degrees. Therefore, what should be the angle of reflection? That means it should reach. And uh, this is another very important equation that can be derived. I'm not going to take the time. It's entirely geometrical. I'll give you the idea. Do you see two triangles there? Similar triangles. This is one of them. I might be spoiling the figure, but observe. That's one triangle. And this is a similar triangle. Why are they similar? Because the bigger the object, the bigger the image, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And the angles, both are right angle triangles, both are right angle triangles, and so the ratio of their sides must be proportional. If you take that ratio, and then you can see two other triangles. I don't know if you can observe it. Can you? Let me use another color to show you this triangle, little one. Is another right angle triangle. Are you watching? And you could also see this as a triangle because you should understand that this AB is highly magnified. It's a small little mirror and A and B are very close to each other, so that's a straight line almost. And the, the curving is not like that. We are not talking about concave mirrors that are stooping down as if they are 95 years old. You know what I mean? It's like this. So all the concave mirrors that we're talking about have a big radius of curvature. Come on, big, small radius of curvature, big. <laughs> you need to visualize all the stuff to be able to do problems. That's why physics is interesting, because all the concepts finally come into play when you try to do a, a problem. And the relation between DODI and DF is the same for mirrors and lenses. So you get two in one package. It's called the law of distances. One over DO plus one over DI is equal to one over F. Does that make sense? And we should be able to do problems easily. The last thing that I want to do today, before we do the lab, is define a quantity called magnification. Magnification is just the ratio of the height of the image to the height of the object. Yeah. If the image is like 20 centimeters high and the object is 10, then the magnification is 2. It has no unit, of course. But from those triangles, we can also prove that magnification is given by negative di by do.
negative di by du. All right. I think the story ends for the day there. So to summarize, the formulas that we studied, the most important ones are 1 over do plus 1 over di is 1 over f. Magnification has two formulas, either hi by ho or negative di by do. And f is equal to r by 2. Remember that. That's it. And we're ready to do problems. Concave mirror. We're not even talked about a convex mirror because I want you to have time to do that lab. All right. Thank you so much.